Hello, welcome to this installment of Twain Fest 2020. Our topic today, education, that path from cocky ignorance to miserable uncertainty. Of course, I should clarify, uh, education and schooling are two very different things. Personally, I've never let schooling interfere with my education. Education consists mostly of what we have to unlearn. Schooling has its place, but um, a boy who carries a tomcat by the tail learns a lesson he can learn in no other way. Today, our uh, life lessons are presented to you by people with more moral authority than I. I hope you shall heed their lessons and benefit from them. Lesson number one on how to become an upstanding member of society. Rules and Regulations by Lewis Carroll. A short direction to avoid dejection by variations in occupations and prolongation of relaxation and combinations of recreations and disputations on the state of the nation in adaptation to your station by invitations to friends and relations, by evitation of amputation, by permutation in conversation and deep reflection, you'll avoid dejection. Learn well your grammar and never stammer. Write well and neatly and sing most sweetly. Be enterprising, love early rising. Go walk of six miles, have ready quick smiles with lightsome laughter, soft flowing after. Drink tea, not coffee. Never eat toffee. Eat bread with butter. Once more, don't stutter. Don't waste your money, abstain from honey. Shut doors behind you, don't slam them, mind you. Drink beer, not porter. Don't enter the water till to swim you are able. Sit close to the table. Take care of a candle. Shut a door by the handle. Don't push with your shoulder until you're older. Lose not a button. Refuse cold mutton. Starve your canaries. Believe in fairies. If you are able, don't have a stable with any mangers. Be rude to strangers. Moral? Behave. <laughs> Lesson number two, Nutrition and Self-Care. Ballad of the Jelly Cake by Eugene Field. A little boy, whose name was Tim, once ate some jelly cake for tea, which cake did not agree with him, as by the sequel you shall see. My darling child, his mother said, pray do not eat that jelly cake. For after you have gone to bed, I fear it will make your stomach ache. But foolish Tim demurred unto his mother's warning word. That night, while all the household slept, Tim felt an awful pain. And then, from out the dark, a nightmare leapt and stood upon his abdomen. Oh, I cannot breathe, the infant cried. Oh, Mrs. Nightmare, pity take. There is no mercy, she replied, for boys who feast on jelly cake. And so, despite the moans of Tim, the cruel nightmare went for him. At first, she tickled Timmy's toes or roughly smite his baby cheek. And now she rudely tweak his nose or utter petty vengeance reek. And then, with hobnails in her shoes and her two horrid eyes aflame, the mare proceeded to amuse herself by prancing o'er his frame. First to his throbbing brow and then back to his little feet again. At last, fantastic, wild and weird and clad in garments ghastly grim, a scowling hoodoo band appeared and joined in worrying little Tim. Each member of this hoodoo horde surrounded Tim with fierce ado, and with long cruel gimlets bored his aching system through and through. And while they labored all night long, the nightmare neighed a dismal song. Next morning, looking pale and wild, poor little Tim emerged from bed. Good gracious, what can ail the child, his agitated mother said. We live to learn, responded he, 
And I have lived to learn to take plain bread and butter for my tea, and never, never jelly cake. For when my hulk with pastry teems, I must expect unpleasant dreams. Lesson number three, Metaphysics by Oliver Herford. Why and wherefore set out one day to hunt for wild negation? They agreed to meet at a cool retreat on the point of interrogation, but the night was dark and they missed their mark and driven well nigh to distraction, they lost their ways in a murky maze of utter abstruse abstraction. Then they took a boat and were soon afloat on a sea of speculation, but the sea grew rough and their boat, though tough, was split into an equation. As they floundered about in the waves of doubt, rose a fearful hypothesis, who chivered with glee as they sank in the sea, and the last they saw was this. On a rock-bound reef of unbelief, there sat the wild negation. Then they sank once more and were washed ashore on the point of interrogation. Lesson number four, Natural Sciences. A Nonsense Rhyme by James Whitcomb Riley. Jing litty jing! And what will we sing? Some crankety crankety thing that rhymes and chimes and skips sometimes, as though wound up with a kink in the spring. Junkety crung and chunkety plung. Sing the song that the bullfrog sung, a song of the soul of a mad tadpole that met his fate in a leaky bowl. And it's oh for the first false wiggle he made in a sea of pale pink lemonade. And it's oh for the thirst within him pent and his hopes that burst as his reason went, when his strong arm failed and his strength was spent. Sing, oh, sing of the things that cling and the claws that clutch and the fangs that sting till the tadpole's tongue and his tail upflung quavered and failed with a song unsung. Oh, the dank despair and the rank morass where the crawfish crouch in the cringing grass and the long limp rune of the moon wails on for the mad, sad soul of a bad tadpole forever lost and gone. Jingle-dee-gee, -gee, and now we'll see what the last of the lay shall be as the dismal tip of the tune, oh friends, swoons away and the long tail ends and it's oh and a lack for the tangled legs and the spangled back of the green grigs eggs and the unstrung strain of the strange refrain that the wings wind up like a strand of and it's oh, also, for the ears wreath blow like a laurel wreath on the lifted brow of a frog that chants of the why and the how and the wherefore too and the thus and so of the wail he weaves and a woof and woe. Twangle then with your wrangling strings the tinkling links of a thousand things, and clang the pang of a maddening moan, till the echo, hid in a land unknown, shall leap as he hears, and hoot, and hoo, like the wretched wraith of a whoop de doo Lesson number five, logic. The guinea pig. There was a little guinea pig 
who, being little, was not big. He always walked upon his feet, and never fasted when he'd eat. When from a place he ran away, he never at that place did stay. And while he ran, as I am told, he never stood still for young or old. He often squeaked, and sometimes violent, and when he squeaked he was not silent. Though never instructed by a cat, he knew a mouse was not a rat. One day, as I am certified, he took a whim and fairly died. And as I'm told by men of sense, he has never been seen living since. Lesson number six, Mathematics, by Laura E. Richards. I studied my arithmetic and then I went to bed and on my little pillow white laid down my little head. I hoped for dreams of dear delight, of sugar candy bliss. But oh, my sleep, the live long night was filled with things like this. At 40 jars of damson jam to 50 loaves of cake, subtract a cow and tell me how much butter it will make. Then add the butter to the jam and give it to a boy. How long will it take ere grievous ache should dash his childish joy? If 20 men stole 30 sheep and sold them to the Pope, what would they get if he should let them have the price in soap? And if he slew each guileless beast and in pontific glee sold lead and loin for Roman coin, what would his earnings be? Next, if a tiger climbed a tree to get a coconut, and if by hap the feline chap should find the shop was shut, and if 10 crabs with clawing dabs should pinch his bangle toes, what for remain should he gain the ground, do you suppose? Divide a stick of licorice by 20 infant jaws. How much, how long must each lose power of speech in masticating paws? And if these things are asked of you while you're a chewing of it, what sum of birch, rod, pole, or perch would be your smarting profit? I woke upon my little bag in anguish and in pain. I'd sooner lose my brand new shoes than dream those dreams again. Oh, girls and boys who crave the joys of slumber, calm and deep. Away then, kick your arithmetic before you go to sleep. Lesson number seven, Astronomical History. The Man in the Moon by James Whitcomb Riley. Said the raggedy man on a hot afternoon, My sakes, what a lot of mistakes some little folks makes on the man in the moon. But people that's been up there to see him, like me, and calls on him frequent and intimately, might drop a few hints that would interest you clean through. <laughs> if you wanted him to, some actual facts that might interest you. Oh, the man in the moon has a crick in his back. Whee, whim, ain't you sorry for him? And a mole on his nose that is purple and black. And his eyes are so weak that they water and run if he even dares dream to look at the sun. So he just dreams of the stars, as the doctors advise. Oh, my eyes! But isn't he wise to just dream of the stars, as the doctors advise? And the man in the moon has a boil on his ear. Whee wing! What a singular thing! I know, but these facts are authentic, my dear. There's a boil on his ear and a corn on his chin. He calls it a dimple, but dimples stick in. <laughs> Yet it might be a dimple turned over, you know. <laughs> Wang, ho, oh, why certainly so. It might be a dimple turned over, you know. <laughs> And the man in the moon has a rheumatic knee. Oh, gee whiz, what a pity that is. And his toes have worked around where his heels ought to be. So whenever he wants to go north, he goes south. And oh, 
comes back with the porridge crumbs all around his mouth, and he brushes them off with a Japanese fan. <laughs> Wing Wham, what a marvelous man! What a very remarkably marvelous man! And the man in the moon, that poor raggedy man, gets so, so lonesome, you know, up there by himself since creation began, that when I call on him and then come away, he grabs me and holds me and begs me to stay till, <laughs> well, if it wasn't for Jimmy come Jim Dad Lim, I'd go partners with him. <laughs> Just jump my bob and be partners with him. <laughs> oh.